good morning. Thank you for coming to see me <laughs> speak. And thank you, Creative Mornings, for inviting me. It's exciting to be part of this, uh, what seems to be a really nice community and a really nice series of events. Uh, so yeah, thank you for introducing me. Yeah, my name is Ana Gridea. So I work, uh, I'm an architect at Lund University uh, and I'm based in Copenhagen. Um, so you might be wondering, um, how come I'm here to talk to you about nature uh, as an architect? Because as architects, we usually, what we do is build. We build buildings, we build cities, things that normally take, away, take space away from nature. Um, but it might be worthwhile to reconsider this uh, opposition between uh, cities and nature, between culture and nature. Um, because just as the dams that beavers build, we consider that to be part of nature. Why shouldn't we think the same? about our homes. What if our homes, what if architecture is part of nature? Um, but at the same time, uh, we, of course, we must face the urgent ecological crisis um, and the Anthropocene and act responsibly for the impact that we do make on nature. Um, and I think this, this must mean that we need to reconsider the position we have towards nature and our relationship to it. Um, so what does this mean for architecture? Um, our current model is, um, so our current model is based on extraction. Um, it's, it's based on um, mining rare materials out of the earth and then with high energy processing them and then transporting them for large distances. So there should be no surprise that this is not sustainable. Uh, so buildings and their construction together account for 36% of global energy use and 39% of energy related carbon uh, CO2 emissions worldwide. These, uh, these stats are from 2017, a UN environment report, but unfortunately they're still uh, relevant today. And the ones on the stats on the right are from waste generation. Uh, so the building construction industry and households themselves, like they produce large amounts of waste. This is from Europe. Um, so what can we do about this? Build more sustainably, you could say, uh, right? But it depends. What do we mean by that? Uh, so this is a Bloomberg Headquarters by Norman Fosters uh, in London. You might recognize it. It was finished in 2018. And it won the Sterling Prize, which is really big in architecture. Uh, and it won many other accolades, right? It's, it's been dubbed the most sustainable building in the world. So it has achieved the highest BREEAM uh, standard, outstanding, the highest, the highest rating it they ever gave. So BREEAM is the Building Regulation Environmental Certification Program. Um, so it has the highest standard given by them. And of course it does some really good things. It uses a lot less water um, when it runs, a lot less um, energy. But if you do look closer, it has some very high embodied energy levels. Um, so in the facade, it uses 600 tons of bronze that are imported from Japan and an entire quarry of granite that was uh, imported from India. Uh, not to mention the embodied energy in concrete. So to reference Phineas Harper, who is um, <clears throat> the curator of the Oslo Biennale last year, this, what you can see here is Spencer de Grey, the head architect of Norman Foster. And he was in charge of the, of the Bloomberg bird building. So they, at Norman Foster, they collaborated with UN uh, to visualize, uh, to map and visualize the Paris Agreement and what are the implications for that. And as you know, Paris Agreement uh, was made to keep the, the global temperature rise at under two degrees, ideally one and a half degrees within this century. Um, so as you can see, he mapped here um, 
and that the Bloomberg building manages to achieve only a three degrees increase in temperature. So this should make us think, is this enough? Because the most sustainable building in the world, right, with highest standards made, is only fueling global warming more, more than twice that we can afford. So what can we do? <laughs> um, I'm proposing a, an alternative model. So instead of relying on highly processed materials with high transportation energy, a centralized production relying on finite resources that are non-biodegradable and man meant to last forever um, in the hopes that the initial investment, <clears throat> the initial cost of construction will be offset during that forever, but we might not have forever. So instead, I'm proposing um, a model of growth. And by growth, I do not mean economic growth, but biological growth. Um, so that it, so that would be about low processing, locally sourced material and a distributed production um, using regenerative resources that are biodegradable and temporary. So this is already happening in different industries. Uh, there's a movement of makers, biologists, designers that are embr embracing this challenge of alternative production. <clears throat> and this makes sense because biology is the most powerful manufacturing technology that we know of. So why not use it? It's completely circular and sustainable because it is the very definition of these terms. Um, so in our lab, we are learning from and designing with nature to answer some really difficult questions. Um, so one of the ways we do that is using biofabrication. Uh, so biofabricated. Natalia, <laughs> do you mind putting a, turning off your microphone, please? Thank you. Uh, yes, so biofabricated bio material is um, is when a living material is used, is employed in the fabrication of, of that material. So as raw material, but not as pre-existing biomass, but when living cells are employed um, in the process of the production of the material. So following on this, uh, my work has led me to discover the exciting world of fungi. So fungi are really amazing organisms. Um, as you might know, they're more, they're closer to, uh, they're in the animal kingdom, so they're closer to us than plants uh, in some ways. So they've been breaking down organic and inorganic matter for millions of years, forming soil. Um, so the more we learn about fungi, the less the natural world makes sense without them. Um, so the contribution that the fungi that fungi make to our larger ecology is fundamental. And to quote Marilyn Sheldrake, uh, fungi are eating rock, making soil, digesting pollutants, nourishing as well as killing plants, surviving in space, inducing visions, producing food, making medicines, manipulating animal behavior, and influencing the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. So it makes sense to have a closer look. Uh, because there is a great variety of behaviors and properties that they exhibit in their growth. So fungi are everywhere, but they largely go unseen. Um, you might know them by mushrooms, right? So mushroom forming fungi are the most well known because they are the most visible, but there are so many more others um, that we don't see so easily. So just as mushroom is the fruit of the, of the fungi, mycelium, which is what I'm gonna be talking about today more, is the actual body of the fungi. And this forms an intricate three-dimensional network underground um, that can reach really wide areas. And this is something that had relevance to us. So now I'm gonna go on a side story. Uh, what you're looking at now is a fungo fungus comb uh, this is um, this is done. This is something that's done by termites. So David Andreen, who's my supervisor, uh, he's been studying termite mouths and their physiology, and uh, figuring out 
what what can we apply from architecture from that? Um, so termites, they live in, uh, this species of termites lives in symbiosis with the fungus because termites themselves cannot digest plant matter. Uh, so they live together with this fungus species um, and termites bring plant matter inside the mound and, uh, and the fungus breaks it down. So together in this process, they create these really beautiful, intricate three-dimensional geometries um, that that are really interesting for us because they're quite so it's, it's basically par partially decomposed plant matter that is held together by the fungus um, but it's it's really lightweight and quite strong relative to its volume and its mass um, so we said what what if we can let's look into this what if this is something we can take into architecture um, what if we can grow buildings instead? So this is how uh, the project started um, with the question, what can we learn from this process and apply it to architecture at human scales? So the aim was to replicate this, uh, but with 3D printing, not with termites, um, but did not use any kind of plastics. So no synthetic glues or highly processed materials but to directly use a biological process in order to build. So this is where my project sits. Um, it involves applied microbiology, digital fabrication and digital computation under the umbrella of design-led research, which is my main met methodology. So it involves working in a microbiology lab which is very exciting as well as terrifying for an architect uh, pr previously not trained in biology. There's a really interesting clash of worlds and methods and people that to learn to navigate. Uh, but of course, I don't work alone. So Dimit I, I work together with Dimitrios Flodas, who's a really talented mycologist um, who taught me a lot about the introduction of how to, how to behave in a lab and many other things. We have a really great collaboration. <clears throat> uh, so here you can see a collection of petri dishes showing all the cultures uh, made in order to isolate a single species. <clears throat> so in the middle here, this one, um, it was successful. So we managed finally to isolate the species from the termite mound, amongst many, many other more. Um, so this project involves navigating the bio lab but um and the the biology world but the material science world as well so what is in our material then fungi of course yes but fungi need a base to grow in um so we have tested a wide range of materials and found a combination of cellulose and wood chips um byproducts from the furniture industry so there's a really great opportunity here not only to use locally sourced materials, but to use waste products and vice products instead of raw. Um, so this is just a photo of me working in a lab in the laminar flow cabinet, um, inoculating material with a fungus. It's really fun and challenging to work with a material that has agency um, because it's actually alive. There has to be a lot of negotiation between me and the fungi <laughs> who want to do their own thing. Of course, they want to <laughs> be free in the world, <laughs> in nature, and they're kind of, of course, I want them to grow in some specific conditions and kind of learning what it is that they want and kind of slowly navigate them uh, to find some common ground. So these are steps in the biofabrication of our material. It starts with um, a culture an isolated culture in a petri dish, um, which is then blended, which is then propagated on a, on a substrate, right, our material with cellulose and wood, and then it's 3D printed, and then it's grown again, um, and then it dries before it can be used. So a lot of the work is back and forth between the bio lab and the print lab, and the print lab is what it all comes together where all the material tests and prototypes are made. Um, so of course, in kind of in this, 
interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary work, I had to create my own protocols, things that don't exist already in each of the disciplines separately. And this created some really, this resulted in some really nice moments of discovery, but as well as, as well as some really funny situations. For example, going to the to the microbiology lab with buckets of material to incubate in, which is really funny for, for a microbiologists because they're used to work at very different scales um, to run experiments in, not buckets. Um, but as well as coming with the material to the print lab and having to print in sterile conditions so that it doesn't get contaminated, uh, which is quite challenging for an architectural workshop because they tend to get quite messy. Uh, so the aim was to create a full-scale prototype to demonstrate that it's possible to do this already, it's scalable, um, and to see the properties of the material in a human scale and not just as lab experiments in a petri dish. <clears throat> so we've done lots of tests in the material. Here you can see, um, so I 3D scanned the prototype to check the distortion because it, as it goes from 3D model uh, to print, to growing and then drying, uh, lots of stages that affect um, the design and shape. And this is just to understand um, what it happens to, to the shape, how does it hold and what are the things that influence it. And of course, we look at it under the microscope to see the interaction between the fungi and the material. And the mycelium network, the one I've been talking to you before, uh, here you can see how it grows um, and it spreads throughout the material. So in its quest of reaching for food, because the material that I provided, the base that it grows, is basically food for the fungus. Um, so in a quest for reaching for nutrients, it binds the material together, it grows all around it, and it, and it transforms it, um, acting as a glue, basically, but of biological nature. <clears throat> and here uh, we can see how uh, tests on how it reacts to water. Um, so on the left, you have the control, the baseline, without any, without any, wa without any fungus in, and you can see with a droplet of water, it kind of it absorbs it. Um, in the middle, it's another fungus, and then to the right, it's the fungus species that we chose for the final prototype. You can see that the droplet, it's, it holds its shape, which means that it's water repellent, right? It doesn't absorb the water, uh, which is very beneficial for architectural application because um, we do have to face water <laughs> in architecture. Um, so not just that, but it actually, even after being submerged for long periods of time in water, it holds together. Um, so here you can see again, it's, um, it's the same experiment at, at three different points in time. Uh, the circle on the left is a control uh, without any fungus. And then the one to the right is with, with the final species of fungi. And then, so after 10 hours of being submerged into water and then even stirred, so mechanical pressure applied to it, it still holds together as one piece, which is really interesting uh, because it means that the material is completely transformed in a biological way. Um, and all this while, remain, while still remaining biodegradable, which is something we wanted to achieve from the beginning. <clears throat> So where are we now? Uh, this is a photo <laughs> from my office. Uh, this is how the project currently looks now. Um, so it got accepted at a triennial conference um, and it got published, but the plan was to present it um, at the conference in April, which of course didn't happen, um, but also, also, the, the plan was to, to exhibit the finalized column structure uh, in London, which of course didn't happen, but not only that, but when the virus situation came, it interrupted also the, the development of the project because of course I can't be in the lab. Um, 
but now things are slowly opening um, and we have most of the pieces in place. Um, so soon you can look forward to seeing um, a fully 3D printed uh, fungal column <laughs> if you stay tuned. <clears throat> so <clears throat> just on a final note, I want to briefly mention the other research project that we're working on which is also incorporating nature, but in a different way. So not building with living matter, um, but through design and digital fabrication to invite nature in. So we're looking at the wall, instead of being a divisive element, uh, it instead becomes a membrane that breathes, that connects the interior with the exterior and has different functions that are not exclusive to immediate human benefit. So it basically invites different species of plants and animals and insects to live in and occupy it, uh, not just humans. So to conclude, I think there's different ways that I think it's time to rethink uh, our relationship with nature. Uh, and it's important to now act on finding ways to extend our stay on the planet, but also for the well-being of other species. So <laughs> thank you very much.